Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our Sunday School class on the Chronicles of Narnia. This morning, we're going to be discussing the planet Mercury as it relates to the horse and his boy. So here is uh, what our schedule looks like right now. So a couple things. Um, to begin with, be aware that we do not meet next week. Next week is Easter, so, so there will be no adult Sunday school classes. But uh, we will be meeting the week after that. We'll be picking it up again with the magician's nephew. And we are close to the finish line for this class. So um, after today, we will have just the magician's nephew and the last battle, and we'll have a concluding lesson. All told, that's going to be five more lessons after today. But I want to start today with some more trivia. I'm sad because I don't see the hunter kids here. So you guys are going to have to carry the class for them now, all right? We'll see how you do. But I'm going to give you a minute to answer as many of these trivia questions as you can. Then we'll discuss them together. All right, should we start going through these together? Let's do it. Number one, what kind of money or currency is used in Kalorman? Crescents. Crescents, very good. So that's one of those ideas that Lewis got from uh, Middle Eastern Islamic culture. Number two, how did Bree and Huynh first leave Narnia? Not leave Kalorman, but leave from Narnia to Kalorman. They were kidnapped. They were captured by the Kalormians. That's right. That's right. Uh, number three, what does Erevis do right before escaping from her family? She drugs the servant girl of her stepmother in order to sneak away. Uh, all right. Number four, who gave counsel to Edmund and the Narnians in Tashban regarding the Great Desert's secret Northwest Passage? The raven. That's right. The raven named Swallowpad. Okay, number five, what landmark guides the heroes through the desert? It's a peak. Yes, it's a mountain called Mount Pyre. Towards the end of the story, you find out the story behind that mountain. It was actually a petrified two-headed giant. So that's the landmark, Mount Pyre. Number six, what kind of wild beasts does Shasta hear at the tombs? Jackals. They are jackals. Number seven, what were you supposed to say about the Tizrock every time you mention him? May he live forever. Very good. A lot of you got that one. Good. Number eight, what is the first creature Shasta encounters in Narnia? It was a hedgehog. A hedgehog. I don't think it was named, but it was a hedgehog. Number nine, who kidnapped Shasta as a baby? Remember, he, he was Prince Kor, you know, the, the firstborn son of King Loon. Who kidnapped him? How did he end up in Kalorman in the first place? So his name was Lord Bar. I think he was like the, was he the Grand Vizier? I can't remember the exact title, but he was one of the, uh, he was in the king's court. He was caught for embezzlement. And rather than being exiled, he was just deposed. But um, sort of in vengeance for that, um, he kidnaps Prince Kor, uh, and they, uh, flee their, uh, uh, they, they flee to the, the sea, and um, King Loon and his warship is hot on their tail. They catch up to them. There's this great sea battle. Uh, I think Lord Barr is killed during that uh, sea battle, but uh, one of Barr's men flees in a lifeboat with Prince Kor, and they make their way to Kalorman. That um, man died at sea, but Kor was picked up by Arshish, the Kalormian. So that's the story of how Shasta originally ended up in Kalorman. And then finally, what was Rabadash the Ridiculous called during his lifetime? What title did he have? Now, you might remember, what did Aslan do to Rabadash? So he got turned into a donkey and, uh, by Aslan and said, if you want to turn back into a human, you have to go back to the Temple of Tash in Tashban, and you have to stay within 10 miles of that temple for the rest of your life. Otherwise, you'll turn back into a donkey and stay that way forever. So Rabadash was forced to stay in the capital, Tashban, for the rest of his reign, and therefore he could never go to war. That's how he got the title Rabadash the Peacemaker. So that was his title during his lifetime. So those are your trivia questions for today. A little bit harder than last week, um, but uh, all right. So your homework is to finish reading The Magician's Nephew when we meet again in two weeks. That way you'll be ready for our trivia for that class. Okay, last week I made it through three of the key themes from The Horse and His Boy. We talked about Zenzucht. Who remembers what that is for those of you who were here last week? 
longing for a far country, nostalgia, right? Um, something along those lines. It's that, that yearning we have within us for something that nothing in this world can satisfy. It's a theme that runs throughout Lewis's writings, and it's very apparent in this book as well, The Horse and His Boy, with the concept of northernness, a place that Shasta can't remember, but his heart belongs there. So um, that was one of our key themes. We talked about reward, how once you've accomplished one task, the, the, the Lord gives you a bigger and more difficult task as a reward. And then self-regard, you know, this is the fundamental problem with Kalormine society, that they're always so image-focused and so vain um, uh, and ambition-seeking that, um, yeah, it, um, it's, it's based on a disordered worship. They're worshiping the wrong God, which then translates to disordered cultural values. So we talked about that. There's one more key theme I want to talk about this morning before we get into Michael Ward's book, and that is the theme of providence. And this brings us to one of my favorite encounters with Aslan in the entire series. That is the scene where Shasta finally meets Aslan. So let me set up the context for you. Who knows at what point in the story does Shasta finally meet Aslan? It's at the point where Shasta has finally met King Loon and his men, um, and he warns them, he delivers the message to them that Rabidash and the Kalormine troops are on their way to uh, besiege the capital, Anvard. And so they give Shasta a horse, and they have to make their way through the mountain pass to Anvard again. Shasta gets separated. He takes a right at a fork in the road when he should have taken a left or something. Um, the R Rabidash's troops are close behind, but he finds himself going through the mountain pass all by himself, but then he starts to hear breathing. There's some creature nearby that is breathing. And finally, he works up the courage to say, who are you? Turns out to be Aslan, and that is this scene right here. So it's in the middle of the night. There's this mist surrounding Shasta. All he can hear is the sound of this creature breathing. They, they begin this conversation. Shasta doesn't even know yet who or what this creature is. But he's talking about, so at this point, Aslan, the voice, he's only called the voice. He's not identified yet as Aslan. Says, tell me your sorrows. And so Shasta talks about all these struggles that they've been through, all these hardships, and they keep pressing forward at the point of exhaustion, beyond the point of exhaustion, and Shasta at this point says, don't you think it was bad luck to meet so many lions, said Shasta? You might recall how many times says he encountered lions during this story. When they first meet Erebus, and then, um, you know, just recently right before they meet up with the Hermit of the Southern March, and that's when, you know, the lion, like, scratches um, Erebus. And so um, Aslan's response is, there was only one lion, said the voice. What on earth do you mean? I've just told you there were at least two the first night, and... There was only one, but he was swift of foot. By the way, one of the themes of Mercury, swiftness. I think that might be relevant here. How do you know? I was the lion. And as Shasta gaped with open mouth and said nothing, the voice continued. I was the lion who forced you to join with Erebus. I was the cat who comforted you among the houses of the dead. I was the lion who drove the jackals from you while you slept. I was the lion who gave the horses the new strength of fear for the last mile so that you could reach King Loon in time. And I was the lion you do not remember who pushed the boat in which you lay, a child near death, so that it came to shore where a man sat, wakeful at midnight, to receive you. Who are you? asked Shasta. Myself, said the voice, very deep and low so that the earth shook. And again, myself, loud and clear and gay. And then the third time, myself, whispered so softly you could hardly hear it. And yet it seemed to come from all around you as if the leaves rustled with it. I think there's a biblical allusion here. What does this, express, this statement here remind you of from the Bible? I am who I am, right? Very much so. It's the encounter between Moses and God at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, 
the Lord, that is Yahweh or Jehovah, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Question, what is the significance of the expression I am, or I am who I am? What does that mean? Why did God reveal himself that way? He who causes to be, that is another possible translation of of that text. So he is the creator, we are the creature. That is one way of interpreting it. What else might it mean? He's outside of time, right? So he's not bounded by our world of change and flux. He he transcends it, so it refers to his transcendence. It refers to his um, self-existence. He doesn't depend on anything else. He is not who we call him to be. He is not what we hope he is. He defines himself. Aseity, there's a great $5 word for you this morning. Aseity, that means his from himselfness. Um, he, he does not proceed from any other cause or principle. He is his own cause. He is uh, unchanging as well. It's not that he is something one day and something else the next day. He always is who he is. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. All of these ideas are bound up in in God's statement to Moses, I am who I am. So when Aslan says myself to Shasta, I think the same concept is in the background there. Another thing, Aslan says myself three times. What does that indicate to you? The Trinity, right? And I think this is one of the most overt references to the Trinity in the entire Chronicles of Narnia as well. The, ver- the, the first reference, it's um, uh, so deep and low that the earth shook. That's an expression of the power of the Father. Then myself, loud, clear, and gay. That's the, the brightness of the sun. Christ is the light of the world. And then the whisper In the third time, that refers to the Holy Spirit. So you might know that breath, wind, and spirit are all the same word in Greek and in Hebrew as well. And so I think there's a very clear Trinitarian reference here in this revelation of Aslan to Shasta at this point in the story. But also notice the context of when Aslan reveals himself to Shasta here. Shasta, at this point in the story, finds out that the lion was always with him and not to harm him, but to do him good, to spur him towards his mission. He was necessary the whole way. Shasta could not have accomplished this task without the lion. And so I think we get a very clear description of the biblical doctrine of providence. And here's how the book, uh, A Family Guide Guide to Narnia puts it by Kristen Ditchfield. I loved this connection because I was thinking this as well. Um, In many ways, The horse and his boy is very similar to the book of Esther. Just how in the book of Esther, God is always in the background. He's never mentioned. But the story moves forward because of the hidden providential work of God. That's exactly what happens in the horse and his boy as well. In the biblical story, an orphaned Jewish girl is chosen to reign as queen over the pagan land of Persia. Through incredible circumstances, she saves the entire Jewish race from total annihilation. Although God's name is never mentioned in the book of Esther, it becomes clear that he is the author and orchestrator of every miraculous circumstance. Both Shasta and Esther experience dark moments when they feel abandoned or when it seems their lives are spiraling out of control. But in the end, both experience the truth of Romans 8.28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So that was the fourth and final theme that I wanted to address from the horse and his boy. But now we can move into Michael Ward's book, Planet Narnia. So um, this week, as we're looking at the connections to the horse and his boy, we're, we're going to be exploring the planet Mercury. So who could recap very briefly for us, what is the planet Narnia thesis? What is Michael Ward trying to do with this theory? That's right. That's a very good way to put it. According to this theory, uh, Lewis was deliberately using... Um, the symbolism and themes associated with each, with each of the seven medieval planets to a corresponding book within the Chronicles of Narnia. And those themes inform the plot, the literary details of the story, and also the Christological theme of each book within the Chronicles of Narnia. So we've looked at how, like, for example, the, 
The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe reflects Jupiter. Prince Caspian reflects Mars. The Voyage of the Dawn Treader reflects the sun, silver chair, the moon. Um, and so today, we're looking at the horse and his boy as it reflects Mercury. Now, according to C.S. Lewis, each planet had certain qualities associated with it. So with Mercury, we see the themes of swiftness, learning in speech and language, and this theme of division and recombination. Each planet has a particular metal associated with it as well. And of course, the metal for Mercury is mercury, or sometimes known as quicksilver. And how is Christ depicted within the horse and his boy? According to Ward, it's Christ as the word of God. And so we're going to look at how are all of these themes expressed within the horse and his boy. Now, I'll just give you like a, a caveat up front. Not all scholars are convinced of the planet Narnia thesis. Uh, I am pretty convinced. Um, there are some books that I think it's much easier to make the connection than with others. So I think, you know, the Jupiter connection with Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, I think that one's very clear. The Sun, as it connects to the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, definitely. I would also argue The Last Battle, as it connects to Saturn. Those ones are probably my top three. Horse and His Boy, initially at least not so much. The more I think about it, though, I think it does hold up. But this one didn't quite leap off the pages for me as it did with some of the other books. But I'm going to try to make the case to you this morning that Lewis was intending to use mercurial themes in the way he wrote The Horse and His Boys. So by the end of class, you'll have to tell me whether or not I've convinced you. But I want to give you some background from some of C.S. Lewis's other writings so you can see what did Lewis himself say about the mercurial themes. What do we know Lewis thought about mercury? So as with the other um, Michael Ward lessons that I've taught, I'm going to look at two main sources from C.S. Lewis. The Discarded Image, which was his final book, which was published right after he died. And then also his poem, The Planets, which was written earlier in his career. Both of those sources give us a very clear description of the themes that Lewis associated with each planet. Here's what he had to say about Mercury. So in The Discarded Image, Lewis says, Mercury produces quicksilver. Dante, so the author of the Divine Comedy from the Middle Ages, gives his sphere to beneficent men of action, um, or you could also say ambitious men. I think Emperor Justinian, the Christian emperor, is there in that sphere of heaven. Isidore, on the other hand, says this planet is called Mercurius because he is the patron of profit. And there's uh, some etymological connections we can make here. So in the English language, we get words like merchant or merchandise or mercenary from the god Mercury. John Gower, another English author, says that the man born under Mercury will be studious and in writing curious. That seems like a whole lot of disconnected themes, doesn't it? Uh, and Lewis admits that. It is difficult to see the unity in all these characteristics. Skilled eagerness or bright alacrity is the best I can do. But it is better just to take some real Mercury in a saucer and play with it for a few minutes. That is what mercurial means. What do you notice when you like play with mercury in a saucer? Sometimes it splits, sometimes it recombines. It's, it's a very playful material. It's, it's like, it's a liquid, but it's, it, it behaves like no other liquid that, that we know of. And so I think the central way of describing the way mercury acts is by these two concepts, componendo et dividendo. Those are the terms that Michael Ward uses. Um, but it just means like to combine and to divide and on and on, over and over. That's what mercury does. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's multiple. Um, it, can, it can do both effortlessly. Here's what Ward has to say about this concept. Lewis found in mercury what Albertus Magnus, who is another medieval philosopher, found in fantasy. Fantasy here, by the way, does not refer to like a genre of literature, like, you know, the Chronicles of Narnia. According to the middle, uh, uh, medieval philosophy, fantasy referred to a faculty within your own mind, a capacity within your own mind. To um, we, we would probably say creativity today. Whenever you take the images that, that your mind receives from the sensory world and you can combine them, you can, you can take them apart, you make associations with them, the whole process of synthesis and analysis as it relates to your imagination. The medievals called that fantasy. And it involves this faculty of componendo et dividendo, separating and uniting. This may explain why Mercury is the god of theft. Those littered under Mercury are snappers up of unconsidered 
tr unconsidered trifles. Because stolen property leaves its owner and is united to the thief and is then typically divided up, fenced, and resold before sometimes being regained by its original possessor. So yeah, this theme of, of thievery, pilfering, is also connected with Mercury. Think of how property is united with one person, then it's separated from them and united to someone else. You're going to see that idea a lot in the horse and his boy, by the way. But let's take a look at the other source by Lewis, the, the poem, The Planets. And in that poem, here's what Lewis has to say about Mercury in particular. Next beyond her, Luna. So Luna is the moon, you know, the lowest sphere of heaven. Right beyond that is the sphere of Mercury. Mercury marches, madcap rover, patron of pilferers, pert quicksilver, his gaze begets, goblin mineral, merry multitude of meeting selves, same but sundered. Look at all the alliteration there. He has a way with words, doesn't he? From the soul's darkness with wreathed wand, words he marshals, guides and gathers them, gay bellwether of flocking fancies. His flint has struck the spark of speech from spirit's tinder, lord of language. He leads forever the spangle and splendor, sport that mingles sound with senses in subtle pattern, words in wedlock, and wedding also of thing with thought. Wow. I mean, there's a lot here, right? I mean, notice there's the theme of, like, speech, language there, you know, wedding thing with thought. You know, that's what, what speech does. But um, guides and gathers, there's a lot of this theme of separating and uniting in this poem as well. And so here's how Michael Ward comments on that poem. Here we see a compact expression of mercurial qualities. His metal, silver, his kleptic influence, patron of pilferers, and his spirit of componendo et dividendo, same but sundered. This last attribute is also suggested by various plural nouns, pilferers, selves, words, fancies, senses, words again, alongside synonyms of joining, meeting, marshalling, gathering, flocking, mingling, wedding. So you take a multiplicity and combine them together. That's mercury for you. Do you get the idea, at least? You have some idea in your mind of like what mercury represents or how it's symbolized, at least in the thought of C.S. Lewis? Um, okay, with that in mind, um, I want to show you, first of all, some of the hints of mercury that we see in The Horse and His Boy. Now, like I said, this was one that didn't initially like leap off the pages for me, um, but I'm going to try to build a cumulative case for you, okay? Maybe each piece of evidence in itself, you'll be like, mm, I'm not so sure I buy that. But once you add it all up, you, you, it's a pretty compelling case. So let me start with just some of the hints of Mercury in the horse and his boy. So as, as uh, Ward argues, each planet is associated with a particular metal, the metal associated with mercury is mercury or quicksilver. So you might think, is there a reference to the metal quicksilver in the horse and his boy? That would, you know, lend support to the argument then, right? Well, here's the closest we do get. And it's, it's during the journey through the desert. The night had now been going on for so many hours that the sand had almost finished giving back all the sun heat it had received during the day. And the air was cool, fresh, and clear. Under the moonlight, the sand, in every direction, as far as they could see, gleamed as if it were smooth water or a great silver tray. Remember how Lewis described mercury? Like, play with it in a saucer, and you get an idea of what mercury is. Now, here, he doesn't use the word mercury or quicksilver, but he describes the sand of the desert like smooth water or a great silver tray. Who here has a chemistry background? Anybody? What is the um, symbol for mercury on the periodic table? It's HG. Do you know what the HG stands for? It's the original word for mercury. Hydrargyrum, which is a mouthful, I know. Hydrargyrum. That's a compound word. Do you know what it comes from? What's hydro? Water. Water. Argyrum, like, ar uh, like Argentina, right? Silver. The original word for mercury was water and silver. How was the desert described in The Horse and His Boy? As water and silver. Something to consider. Is that going to totally tip the scales for you? Maybe not. But it, at least, you know, it, it, it lends support for the argument. Let me give a much more compelling hint. This one was pretty strong for me. 
when Shasta finally sees the Narnians in the city of Tashban, they look very different from the Kalormians. Here's, here's how it, it's described. There were about a half a dozen men, and Shasta had never seen anyone like them before. For one thing, they were all as fair-skinned as himself, and most of them had fair hair, and they were not dressed like men of Kalorman. Most of them had legs bare to the knee. Their tunics were of fine, bright, hardy colors, woodland green or gay yellow or fresh blue. And get this, instead of turbans, they wore steel or silver caps, some of them set with jewels and one with little wings on each side. <laughs> Who wears a cap like that? Mercury. Mercury. Why on earth would Lewis include that little detail? We see no other description of Narnians wearing that, but it's here in The Horse and His Boy. If the planet Narnia thesis is not true, that little detail seems to be pretty random and inexplicable. But if Lewis knew what he was doing, then it makes sense. So these are just some of the mercurial hints. But I think it becomes much more compelling when we look at the recurring themes within the horse and his boy. You might recall last time we talked about Michael Ward, I used two terms, poema and logos. I don't think I defined them last time, so I'm going to do that this time. Poema is, is usually translated something made, and logos means something said. According to literary critics, there are two ways of studying a work of literature. You can study the message itself. That's like the moral of the story. That would be the logos. But you can also study how it was written. What are the literary devices? Um, what, what, what's the recurring vocabulary, the motifs? Is there alliteration? Is there parallelism? Is there repetition? All of that is involved in the poema of a piece of literature. First, we're going to take a look at these um, literary devices that are used and woven into the storyline of the horse and his boy. There's four in particular that I want to highlight for you. There's the theme of separating and reuniting, which, you know, we looked at previously. That's very central to the concept of Mercury. Then there's the notion of urgency and swiftness. Then there's the notion of pilfering or theft. And then there's the notion of speech. It's going to be very obvious very quickly that these are big themes in The Horse and His Boy. They recur over and over again and uniquely in this book, in contrast to all the other books in the series. They're all associated with Mercury, and Lewis himself told us that. If you read his other writings on Mercury, those are the descriptions of Mercury. So once we look at these elements, I, I think it's going to be a pretty compelling argument that Lewis had Mercury in the back of his mind as he wrote The Horse and His Boy. Let's begin with theme number one, separating and reuniting. Think of how many characters separate and reunite in the course of this story. Beginning with Shasta and his twin brother, Corin. So, you know, he's originally you know, Prince Cor of Arkenland. They're separated at, at birth when Lord Barr kidnaps Prince Cor. Then they're reunited at the capital, Tashban, but then they go their separate ways again. Then towards the end of the story, they're finally reunited again at Anvar. Then look at the connections between Shasta and Erevis. First, they're united by a lion that's chasing them both. That's Aslan. Then they get separated on the streets of Tashban when the Narnians swoop up uh, Shasta, mistaking him for uh, Prince uh, Corin. But then they are reunited at the tombs as they journey, when they go to journey through the desert. But then they get separated at the Hermit of the Southern March. So Shasta has to continue forward to catch up with King Loon. Uh, but then they're finally reunited after the battle at Anvard at the, the, the home of the hermit. So this separating and reuniting occurs over and over again with these characters. But also notice like Aslan himself is presented as both many and one. Initially, they think that there are these multiple lions chasing them, separate lions. But then when Shasta finally encounters Aslan, as we looked at in that at one scene, uh, it becomes apparent there was only one lion the entire time. Even the river itself that the city of Tashban is located on is described as separating and reuniting. Here's what it says in chapter 4. A broad river divided itself into two streams, and on the island between them stood the city of Tashban. So even the river itself separates and reunites around the city. Separating and reuniting occurs over and over in this story. Also, Ward makes an interesting connection regarding the twin brothers, Kor and Corin. 
He says, the main pair of brothers, Kor and Korn, are not just twins, but reflections of the twins, Gemini. This constellation is relevant to Lewis's theme because in astrology, Gemini is ruled by Mercury. Gemini consists of the stellated brothers, Castor and Pollux, who are the models for Shasta and Korn. So for those of you who know like your Roman mythology, who were Castor and Pollux? They're twins, yes, good. Raised by wolves. What else do we know about them? They founded Rome. That's right, they founded the city of Rome. They are uh, characters that are described in the Homeric epics as well, like the Iliad and the Odyssey. Now get this. Uh, Castor is described as a horse breaker. Pollux is described as a boxer. How are Shasta and Corin described in The Horse and His Boy? So Shasta rides Bree, the horse, right? A horse breaker. Pollux, the first time that Shasta encounters him, has like a black eye and a missing tooth, right? Because he had gotten into a fight. And then at the end of the story, we find out that Pollux developed a reputation as a boxer. Like he was known as, um, as uh, Corin the boxer. So I think the connection with Gemini is very, very clear. What I wasn't so convinced of was the connection between Gemini and Mercury. I did some research on this. It does exist. I don't know if Lewis would have known about that, though. But I definitely think that Castor and Pollux informed uh, Lewis's depiction of Shasta and uh, Corin. Also, I mean, just take the name Shasta and Cor. You mix those letters. That's an anagram for Castor, right? Like, it, it's right there in the names. I'm, I'm pretty certain um, that, that uh, Lewis had them in mind. And so if the connection to Mercury is valid, which I still need to work and figure out if that's true, but yes, this is definitely compelling support for the, the planet Narnia thesis then. Okay, urgency and swiftness is another theme. Now you tell me, where in the storyline do we see these concepts of urgency and swiftness? What parts of the story come to mind for you? The very idea of the horse, right? The concept of the horse itself, you know, urgent and swift. Right, rushing to warn, you know, King Loon and Anvard that, you know, Rabidash is on the way. So they have to outrun Rabidash and his troops. That's right. Right, so they have to hurry away. So, like, Shasta is fleeing from Arshish. Erevis is fleeing from her family, who's trying to force her into a, a marriage with a much older man that she doesn't want to marry. Um, and then they get chased by the lion, right? And so they're running. There's a lot of running and galloping and fleeing and escaping throughout the, the, the whole storyline. Yeah, these are just some of the examples of urgency and swiftness that we see throughout the story. So Shasta and Erebus are being chased by Aslan when they first meet. Then they must cross the Great Desert ahead of Rabidash's troops. Then they're being chased by Aslan again before reaching the Hermit of the Southern March. Shasta must reach King Loon before Rabidash reaches Anvard. And then Shasta rallies Narnian support right as the siege of Anvard is happening. It's the fastest paced story in the entire Chronicles of Narnia. So it's a very clear theme. It's also very clearly associated with Mercury. And so here's what Ward has to say about it. To hesitate is to be lost in this story, for speed is of the essence of Mercury. There is a great sense of urgency throughout the tale with the repeated cries of Narnia and the North. Bree gallops for sheer joy, then for sheer terror. Erevis says there's not a moment to lose after overhearing Rabidash's plans. Aslan chases them to the hermit's dwelling, causing Bree to discover that he has not really been going as fast, not quite as fast as he could. Erevis mentions swift horses, Edmund, a swift galley, Rabidash, the swiftest of galleys. The Tisrock urges his son to be swift. A river is far too swift for swimming. Aslan is swift of foot. You remember how like the silver chair really, really overdid it with the word pale? This book tends to overdo it with the word swift. Chevy is speed. There was a wonderful chase of Lord Barr in the backstory. Shasta is told to run now without a moment's rest. Run, run, always run. He sees a slope of grass and a little heather running up before him. He had only to run. It's all over the place in this story. I think it's very clear that Lewis was trying to communicate this notion of swiftness throughout the story. And also the theme of pilfering or theft. How many times do we see references to theft in the story? Can you think of any? Shasta. Shasta. Exactly. Right. The very premise of the story, right? They're stealing themselves away from their homes, right? So it's like, it's almost, I, would we say that Bree stole Shasta or did Shasta steal Bree? 
Not very clear, right? But yes, they are stolen away from their homes just like Erebus steals herself away from her home. So the very premise of the story begins with theft, self-theft, if, if you can call it that. Yes, Kor gets stolen. He gets kidnapped at the very beginning, like in the backstory. Absolutely. But then, yep, absolutely. I'm gonna show you some examples of theft in this story. Because, and, the, and the, notice something as well. I can't think of other examples of theft in any of the other books. They're all in this one. Why would they be all in this one and only in this one? So here's what Shasta says regarding Bree's suggestion that they use some of his Tarkhan's money um, to pay their way to flee. Won't it be stealing to use the money? Asked Shasta. Oh, said the horse, looking up with its mouth full of grass. I never thought of that. A free horse and a talking horse mustn't steal, of course, but I think it's all right. We're prisoners and captives in enemy country. That money is booty, spoil. So he's sort of rationalizing stealing the Tarkhan's money to finance their, their escape. And then later on, uh, once they've encountered Erevis and Huyn, uh, Huyn had the idea that they just like go straight through uh, the, the city of Tashban. Um, like they belong there practically, because um, that would be the most effective way to get through the city and beyond towards the north. And then they say, uh, though nobody much liked it, it was Huynh's plan which had to be adopted in the end. It was a troublesome one, and it involved a certain amount of what Shasta called stealing and Bree called raiding. One farm lost a few sacks that evening, and another lost a coil of rope the next. So we can see there's another example of theft in the story. And then, yet again, when Shasta is at the tombs, right? So he spends the night at the tombs outside the city and, and Aslan is there in the form of a cat. But then the next day it says, the next job clearly was to get something to eat and drink. So he had no difficulty in doing a little raiding as Bree called it. It involved a climb over a garden wall and the results were three oranges, a melon, a fig or two, and a pomegranate. Lots of pilfering in this story. Why? It occurs over and over and only in this story. And yet Mercury is the god of theft. All right, one more, and this is one of the central themes. So more than theft, Mercury is the god of speech and language. How do we see speech depicted within the horse and his boy? We get many, many examples of both Kalormine proverbs and Narnian proverbs. Let's take a look at some of them. These are some of the Kalormine Proverbs. And I want you to describe the difference between the two types of Proverbs. The Kalormine Proverb is this. Uh, application to the root of business is the root of prosperity. But those who ask questions that do not concern them are steering the ship of folly toward the rock of indigence. The next Proverb is, For as a costly jewel retains its value even if hidden in a dunghill, so old age and discretion are to be respected even in the vile persons of our subjects. And then, for nothing is more suitable to persons of gravity and decorum than to endure minor inconveniences with constancy. Those are the Kalormine Proverbs. Let's take a look at the Narnian Proverbs. Easily in, but not easily out, as the lobster said in the lobster pot. Maybe apes will grow honest. Come live with me and you'll know me. Nests before eggs. How would you describe the difference between them? The Kalormine Proverbs are a lot more wordy. In one sense, like they use bigger words, so they're, they're, they're eloquent, but it's almost like a false eloquence, right? It's a really clunky, overdone way of saying the point. Where Narnian um, Proverbs are much more pithy, they're much more metaphorical, like lobster, ape, nests, right? So they're, they're more earthy. Um, and so Lewis, in his literary criticism, actually contrasted these two ways of writing, and he much preferred the Narnian way of writing to the overly done Kalormine way. He was pretty critical of unnecessary verbiage, and so um, that's why he depicts the Kalormine proverbs the way that he does. But so we can see that just the use of speech and skill in speech is a central element to the story as well. So these are some of the central themes. Oh, also, catch this. How else do we see speech depicted in the storyline? Well, Bree and Huynh have to pretend to be dumb horses while they're in Kalorman, right? Because they don't want to give away that they're Narnian horses. So they pretend to be mute. But then as the storyline progresses, as they advance northward, they talk. But the opposite happens to Rabidash, right? He's the, the, the prince of Kalorman. 
And, and he speeches, he hatches the plot to, to seize uh, Narnia and Arkenland. But what happens when he finally encounters Aslan? He gets turned into a dumb donkey. So he, as he approaches Aslan, he loses his capacity for speech. But as the heroes head towards Aslan, they speak. And so we see this usage of speech um, cleverly portrayed by Lewis in the storyline. You add that all up, it looks like a pretty mercurial story to me. All right, the final point that I want to make to you guys is regarding the mercurial, the mercurial logos. Now, you might recall, I, I just mentioned a, a moment ago, the distinction between poema, something made, and logos, something said. These are two ways of analyzing a piece of literary work. We've looked at all the literary elements and themes that were woven into The Horse and His Boy, but what is the message of the story, particularly as it relates to Aslan and how Aslan depicts Christ within this story? Now, let's take a look at, at what, uh, uh, what happens to the characters when they first encounter Aslan. So here's what Ward has to say at that scene where Shasta finally meets Aslan. And remember, so Aslan reveals himself to Shasta. Um, first, he's just called the voice. But then when he reveals himself, he doesn't say the name Aslan. He says, myself, myself, myself. And here's what Ward says. In this passage, Lewis neatly deploys his mercurial imagery to present one lion in a threefold myself, one God in three persons, a Christianized, get this, Hermes Trismegistus, thrice great Hermes. That was one of the titles. Now remember, in Greek mythology, Hermes is the equivalent of Mercury for Roman mythology. One of the titles for Hermes in Greek mythology was Hermes Trismegistus, which means the thrice great Hermes. It is an obvious theological message to communicate via Mercury. So Christians in the Middle Ages, they thought that the Greek um, reference to Hermes Trismegistus was sort of like a, a foreshadowing or a pagan anticipation of the doctrine of the Trinity. And so they appropriate that a lot in the Middle Ages. And so if we're going to get a clear reference to the Trinity in all the Chronicles of Narnia, the Mercurial book is the one to do it in. And we do see something like that in the encounter between Shasta and Aslan. But also, let's consider the way that the characters respond when they first encounter Aslan. Once they understand who Aslan is, here's what Ward says. We must be clear what kind of experience is being generated. It is not principally an experience containable by more mere words. Shasta does not suddenly start talking. On the contrary, he gaped with open mouth and said nothing. Then, after one glance at the lion's face, he slipped out of the saddle and fell at his feet. He couldn't say anything, but then he didn't want to say anything, and he knew he needn't say anything. In other words, Shasta's response when finding out who Aslan is, is silence. It's kind of the opposite that you'd expect if the theme is Mercury, right? The god of speech, and yet Shasta responds with silence. And a similar silence falls on Erebus and the horses after their encounter with Aslan in chapter 14. Strange to say, they felt no inclination to talk to one another about him after he had gone. They all moved slowly away to different parts of the quiet grass, and there paced to and fro, each alone, thinking. Why would the encounter with Aslan lead to silence? Ward argues it's because there was no need for words because they had encountered the word himself. And here's what Ward goes on to say. Lewis held the view that prayer without words is best. So he's connecting it to what Lewis thought um, himself regarding prayer and, and the most effective prayer, the best kind of prayer. One should try not to verbalize the mental acts. He believed that prayer could not be identical with normal human language because no form of words would be fully adequate to the task of addressing its ineffable subject. Since God himself is the word, no other utterance can suffice. The Christian is but one articulation of that word, and it is not from merely human resources, but by the spirit we cry, Abba. Therefore, in true prayer, God speaks to God. The task of the prayer is to become the increasingly willing participant in that divine speech, not by means of psychological gymnastics, but by the union of wills, ours and God's, 
which under grace is reached by a life of sanctity. Regarding this theme of silence, there's another thing I want to highlight. You remember how one of the central ideas of Mercury is like dividing and recombining? That's also very much at the heart of what happens in speech. You have two separate minds, two individuals. One communicates to the other with words so that they can share a common idea and be united in thought. But what happens when we're united to Christ? We share that mind. We share the mind of Christ, right? We transcend speech itself. When the minds are united, um, we go beyond the necessity for speech in that sense. I wonder if perhaps that is a way of describing the mercurial connection within the horse and his boy. Now, I will also say this. Ward had me when it came to the poema. Did Lewis himself have in mind the logos here? At most, I'd be willing to say it is a valid application. And I'm sure Lewis would approve of it if he, if, if he were told this. Did Lewis actually have it in mind as he was writing the story? I don't know. But it's still a cool point. And I think there's a biblical principle here as well. I'm going to conclude with this passage, which you might be familiar with. Paul says in Romans 8, 26, We do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. So in other words, we do have biblical support for this idea of approaching God in wordless prayer. Simply giving him our thoughts, giving him ourselves, and in so doing, transcending speech itself in seeking our union with God. And so those are the mercurial themes as displayed in the horse and his boy. So let me ask you, are you convinced? You think I'm convinced? Okay, well, I better be, because if I'm not convinced, I don't know how I'm going to convince you. You can't give what you don't have. Maybe. I mean, when you add it all up, I think it does lead to a compelling case. But it's something to consider, at least. So um, next week, we're not here because of Easter. The following week, we'll pick it up again with The Magician's Nephew. And we have only two more books to go, The Magician's Nephew and then The Last Battle. So we're almost there. Any final questions or comments? Okay, let me close this in prayer, and then we can head to the sanctuary. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the gift of your word, your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that through his atoning work, we can be united to you. And we do pray, Lord, that um, you would sanctify us by your Holy Spirit, that we could now approach you in confidence, even when we don't know what words to say. We trust, Lord, that you know the words on our lips even before they are uttered. And we pray, Lord, that we would continue to draw closer to you and to understand your majesty, your ineffability, your aseity, your transcendence. And because of who you are, we would be moved to worship. So we pray, Lord, that that spirit would fill us as as we now enter into corporate worship. We give you the glory, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.